We are live from Bloomer's World Headquarters in New York City, streaming on Twitter and Facebook as well. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, influencing regulatory regimes. Meet Michelle Bond, the woman some have called the power broker for crypto on Wall Street. And renowned Harvard economist and crypto skeptic Ken Rogoff joins us to discuss how digital currencies are reshaping the global economy. Plus, attack of the box, Elon Musk, Twitter's new board member, shares his biggest beef with his favorite social media network. That's all ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of the latest moves in digital tokens. Your best function to do that on the Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. I have a snapshot of some of the bigger moves here. I wanted to point out Bitcoin a little bit softer on the day, but still we're trading just under $46,000. We have been above that $45,000 level now for 10 days in a row. Broke out of that range and we are indeed holding above it. And Bitcoin actually holding up a little bit better than some of the other tokens today. You have Dash, the real underperformer. It's off 3% around 128. Ether is lower by about 1.2%. One of your outperformers on the day is actually Litecoin, Matt. Higher by just about half of 1%. We're trading right around that 125 level. All right, interesting to watch that uh, continued strength in Bitcoin. I'm going to take a look right here at regulation because that is arguably one of the biggest, could be one of the biggest catalysts, one of the biggest things holding back uh, growth in crypto as well. This chart shows in white the SEC, in blue the CFTC in terms of the number of actions they've brought uh, against digital entities or entities involved with digital assets. You can see it's grown substantially from 2015, 2016, 2017, up to the last four years. And what this shows you is that if we continue at this pace or, or even grow, we're going to need at least another $100 million in funding for the CFTC. That's also about 2,000 Bitcoin. And at one point, that was worth about two-fifths, Kaylee, of a pepperoni pizza. The crypto community is calling for more clarity, though, on regulating digital assets. We have uh, some gaps in the way the federal government has been approaching digital assets. The U.S. needs to get its act together. A very fragmented approach to regulation with the SEC and the CFTC and at Treasury. We really don't feel that the SEC is doing everything they can to actually protect investors. They've been regulating by, by enforcement. Yeah. not by clarity. There's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. It's good for policymakers and the good actors in the sector to work together. We want to see more U.S. investors have the ability to add Bitcoin products that provide true Bitcoin exposure. We need to yeah. have a way that all these agencies can coordinate in a formal way so businesses know the rules to the road. I do think the politics have shifted. And uh, just today, we learned that Janet uh, Yellen, Treasury Secretary, is set to push for more comprehensive policy on digital assets in a speech she's going to hold on Thursday. Kaylee has been tracking the latest development on the regulatory front. Kaylee, what do you got? Well, let's start here in the U.S., Matt, because in Washington, lawmakers on Capitol Hill, as well as regulators, are really jockeying for control. You have SEC Chair Gary Gensler, who wants his agency and the top U.S. derivatives regulator, the CFTC, to work together to rein in crypto exchanges. Gensler says more rules are needed for exchanges because retail investors are currently vulnerable to scams and market manipulation. Meanwhile, exchanges, such as FTX, are pushing for the CFTC to take on an expanded role. Then across the Atlantic in the U.K., they they announced a plan for government oversight of stable coins and said it would consult on regulating a wider set of crypto activities. In a speech on Monday, Economic Secretary to the Treasury John Glenn stated the UK is open for crypto business. And Chancellor Rishi Sunak asked the Royal Mint to create an NFT to be issued this summer. Then beyond the UK, European Union officials recently proposed shortening the time frame to implement new crypto rules. Officials are concerned that digital assets could be used by Russian oligarchs to evade sanctions imposed since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. One outstanding issue, though, Matt, the current talks in the current talks is the environmental safeguards that EU lawmakers want to introduce. Yeah, and speaking of Russia, we got some breaking news right now on sanctions. The EU and the U.S. are going to issue a new round of sanctions against Russia tomorrow. These are going to include a ban on all new investment in Russia. They're going to include an increase in sanctions on uh, financial institutions. And we're going to continue to cover Russia's war in Ukraine and the fallout of that in the digital world on today's program. So definitely something... Uh, we're going to talk to our guests about today. Michelle Bond is the first guest of the day, CEO of the Association for Digital uh, Asset Markets. She joins us now. Michelle, 
Thanks so much for coming in the studio. Pleasure to have you here. Um, in terms of regulation, this is something, you know, from, from the very beginning of when I started covering uh, Bitcoin 10 years ago, there was this big libertarian group that was into it and didn't want uh, to deal with any kind of regulation at all. Now the industry seems to be clamoring for it. What do we need? Yeah, so that's exactly right. I think that definitely describes the old crypto um, the past. <laughs> now, in the future, what we're seeing is this begging for regulation. And in fact, what we're even seeing is the industry adopting its own standards, where because the federal government has not been clear in adopting those standards. And we're seeing more people come from traditional finance into crypto. So these are people who are used to seeing regulation and they know how regulation works in equities, fixed income. FX and all the markets. So they're saying, hey, what should crypto have? So I think what we're really seeing is this begging for more regulation so that businesses and industry know what the rules of the road are. They know what the safeguards are. They know what, what, how they can achieve business certainty and clarity without having to fear enforcement action. You know, one of the, I think one of the greatest financial commentators of our time is Matt Levine, who writes <laughs> for Bloomberg, he said the ways, there's only two ways to really get clarity on regulation. Either you do whatever you need to, break the law and get sued by the SEC, then you pay the settlement or the fine and you find out what the rules are, or you wait the five, 10, 25 years it takes for them to create regulation on their own. How can we do, how can we find a third way for them to give us regulation faster without having to go to court? Yeah, so that has historically been the, the positioning. Um, I do think that that's why a lot of the industry is now saying, you know what, we really need to start regulating ourselves. And the industry is calling for self-regulation. They're begging for the CFTC to get more authority over the crypto spot markets because the CFTC could really play a bigger role here. And you're seeing a lot of firms putting out their own policy proposals. Like the industry is actually writing regulation as, as we speak. I, uh, my association, we're a standard setting body. We have a code of conduct. All of our members agree to adhere to the, the code of conduct. We're advancing and market integrity. Include, uh, FTX, uh, the biggest Paxos, exchanges yes. in the world. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that's where the members are saying, you know what, we need to do something on our own because with, you know, the whole panoply of federal regulators in the U.S. and then, you know, we have the states, we have the international bodies all looking at this space. We need to provide our own clarity and let's do that and let's do that in the form of a code of conduct. So that's basically, we've created our own rule book, essentially. Well, on the subject of international bodies, just thinking the U.S. relative to the rest of the world, how does the slower progress on regulation actually potentially affect competitiveness in digital assets here? Yeah, so that's a big hot topic because obviously the U.S. is a global leader and, and a global regulatory leader. So with the, the U.S. being a little bit slower to act, we're seeing other jurisdictions really become friendlier on, on crypto and we're seeing crypto thriving in a lot of other jurisdictions. I would say, for example, Switzerland is one of them where they have a whole hub called Crypto Valley. And it's not because Switzerland is a lax regulatory jurisdiction. It's because they've been friendly and they've actually implemented regulation and they, they want to attract business to, to Switzerland. And we've seen that in a number of other jurisdictions. I think the U.S. is usually just a little bit slower and more deliberative. And I am hopeful that the U.S. will get this right. Uh, I, I do think the U.S. is making tr tremendous progress. But we've seen splinters, right? Yeah. For example, I was looking on your website um, at your list of members and you've got FTX listed right next to FTX US. And this is a case with a lot of businesses. They have to create U.S. subsidiaries that operate at a different speed, a slower speed. That's exactly right, because you can't, because there's a, a double standard. Um, there's what you can do sort of globally. And, and, and by the way, FTX, the international exchange, is, is based in the Bahamas. And the reason they're based in the Bahamas is because the Bahamas has a real regulatory framework. It's mm -hmm. an excellent regulatory framework. That's why they're based there. And then FTX US is based right. in Chicago and, and operates under a different, a different regulatory regime that's US based. Well, and we mentioned earlier, Michelle, that FTX is among the exchanges pushing for the FT, uh, CFT to have a greater role. If the CFTC, it makes sense for them to have a role in the spot market. What role does it make sense for the SEC to play? So the SEC's jurisdiction is securities. So to the extent that something is deemed to be a digital asset security, the SEC will always have jurisdiction over that. However, 
there is no reason to make every single crypto out there, all 10,000 of them, digital asset securities. And it doesn't make sense from a securities law perspective, and it doesn't make sense from a commodities law perspective. So where, where we think there should be, I think, a clear line drawn is for the CFTC to be able to make a determination on what is a digital asset commodity such that the CFTC can be the primary regulator of jurisdiction. And then when that happens, the CFTC can also, and we think this will require some legislation, but we'd like to see the CFTC regulate um, that, that spot market on digital asset commodities. Well, it was great to get you in here, Michelle, and I hope we can get you back when we see some more progress made. Michelle Bond of the Association for Digital Asset Markets. Coming up, we're going to speak with renowned Harvard economist and crypto skeptic Ken Rogoff. Plus, Miami's crypto ambitions, how the city is positioning itself for a new age of the internet. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York. Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey has raised concerns crypto presents opportunities for criminal activity. I mean, he's not the first one, but he's said it again. He spoke yesterday at a Stop Scams event organized by the Bank of England, saying, quote, you only have to ask the question, what do people committing ransom attacks usually demand payment in? The answer is crypto. Joining us now is Harvard economics professor and former IMF chief economist Kenneth Rogoff. Um, Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Real pleasure to have you on the uh, program. Yeah. I have to say, every time someone says something about crimes being committed in Bitcoin, I just think of um, the fact that exponentially more crimes are committed with dollars, right? Someone said to me the other day that two billion of Bitcoin has been hacked, and then I looked at phishing scams and identity theft. We've lost $600 billion um, dollars to those kind of hacks over the last year, uh, just dwarfing the problems we see in crypto. Is it really fair to say that this is like one of the big alarming problems of, of digital assets? Well, I think we have to separate a couple of things. I mean, when I speak to, have spoken for years to people who you know see the potential in some of the innovation here, it's precisely in greater security uh, concerns that the financial system could ultimately be vulnerable and trying to create something better. That's a separate matter from, you know, is someone going to use the pseudonym pseudonymity of, uh, say, Bitcoin uh, to be able to get away with things that at least they think they'll get away with? Uh, those are two separate. Those are two separate questions. And of course, uh, crypto. Bitcoin especially is being used in emerging markets. And it depends on, you know, whose perspective you have of whether, you know, they're evading bad government regulations, bad governments, or they're conducting crime. But I, I think advanced economies do need to be very concerned about the final use uh, of the pseudonymous cryptos. And I want to draw a world of distinction between you know, something like Bitcoin and maybe Ethereum, uh, which, you know, has all sorts of further underlying uses. For sure. But both of them can be tracked on the blockchain. I mean, you make a point of saying pseudonymous instead of anonymous. In fact, when people commit crimes and, uh, you know, demand ransom, for example, in digital assets, you can always find, see where those assets have gone. Whereas if someone just asked for a couple of duffel bags full of $100 bills, they would be off the grid instantly. Um, doesn't that make it easier to, to deal with digital crimes? Well, yes and no. At the moment, it's still pretty expensive to track people. So yes, if you're doing a terrorist action or shutting down the electric grid, it's worth a big investment to try to catch you. But in sort of routine tax evasion, for example, which is what a lot of cash is used for, it's still pretty expensive. Now, you're going to tell me someday it won't be expensive, but then I would say when that day comes, it'll probably undermine a lot of the de final demand for certain kinds of cryptocurrencies. 
Well, and Ken, obviously we are having this conversation more and more frequently given the sanctions currently in place uh, as it, in regard to Russia because of its invasion of Ukraine. We talk a lot about sanctions evasion, but what we've also heard from our guests like Mike Novogratz of Galaxy Digital is that you are seeing the use case of crypto cryptocurrencies as a lifeline for countries who can't necessarily rely on their own fiat currencies. It's helpful to those people. How is your thinking evolving on that side of the equation, not just when it comes to evasion? All right, there's no question that it's being used in a lot in emerging markets. Now, I wouldn't say it's such a big deal yet that it's going to supplant the international financial system otherwise in terms of the sanctions on Russia. Uh, I, I just want to echo something your last guest, Michelle, said, which is you need regulation here. Everybody agrees on this. I think when I wrote about this seven years ago, an area I think I was a little naive was how quickly that might come. And, you know, it feels to me a long ways away, unfortunately, a coherent regulatory structure, and frankly, an international structure, but at least one in the United States. Well, and there continues to be a conversation in Washington, obviously, on regulation, but also on the idea of a digital dollar. Where do you come down on the need for that when stable coins tied to the U.S. dollar already exist? A federally controlled digital dollar, right? Because we do right. already have, you know, the most traded cryptos in the world are digital dollars already. Indeed. Uh, you know, when I listen to central banks talk about the need for a central bank digital currency, I think for a lot of them, at least the big ones, the big central banks, it's actually a, a sort of a reason uh, to try to tell the public to calm down as they get to regulating it. The central bank digital currencies, as they're imagining them, are clearly not going to be pseudonymous or anonymous for sure. They're going to really be substitutes for very similar things. And, and yes, it's not at all clear that stable coins wouldn't order offer a more diverse and better uh, range of things for the consumer if they're properly regulated. So I, 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 you know, it's sort of a little bit of a red her herring, the central bank digital currency. Yes, it's coming, but I think we've so already seen in China, it's come and it doesn't do much. Of course, in China, they can tell people to use things. They can't do that in the United States or most advanced economies. I think, you know, uh, um We've heard so many people talk about a threat to the U.S. dollar, and you just said you don't think this is going to be a, a threat to, you know, the world reserve currency now. But I wonder if you can look at what's happened with Russia. You know, um, they had, they thought, financial resources spread around the world, and then uh, one government or a group of governments just turns that off which has to make them want to look for, and probably other countries and people as well, an alternative form of currency, right? At some point, do we look back and say this could have been the beginning of the end of the dollar as a world reserve currency? Well, that's a little bit hyperbolic, but it could be true, you know, a long time from now. Uh, China and Russia have been looking for an alternative to the dollar for a very long time, and they're just these huge network effects not to mention that in China, the rule of law isn't what it is in the United States. And it's, it's absolutely true that if you look at the smaller countries, again, the emerging markets, the developing economies, that's really a different matter. That's really where it is something of an alternative to the dollar uh, because it's digital. It's, you know, you are, are, can use paper dollars, but they're not doing the same things. But I think China and Russia are going to look for something. I'm not sure it's going to be on a public blockchain. I suspect it'll be centrally controlled. But the, the move that the U.S. did of shutting down the reserves or blocking the reserves of the Russian Central Bank, absolutely historic and will probably accelerate moves in the international financial system. But they're not going to take place at warp speed, something that would have taken 50 years, maybe it's going to take 20 years. Ken, we only have about 30 seconds left, but just quickly, do you still believe Bitcoin is a bubble that inevitably will pop? Well, I've never used the word bubble. I think it needs to be regulated in the advanced economies. I don't think it'll be regulated everywhere. And when it is, I suspect it might be worth a lot less than today, but I don't expect it to see it disappear, but I expect to see other things replace it. You know, MySpace becomes 
uh, Facebook. Uh, Ken, it was really great to get your insight. Really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Ken Rogoff there of Harvard talking to us about crypto. Coming up, Miami's crypto ambitions, how the city is positioning itself for a new age of the internet. This is Bloomberg. Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Matt Miller. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the crypto world. The hottest NFT marketplace has most of its users selling to themselves. According to data compiled by the NFT tracker CryptoSlam, 95% of the total activity on the Lookswear platform is from so-called wash sales that help users earn rewards in the form of more coins. It's seen as a gray area of crypto regulation. Miami is positioning itself to be at the center of the crypto revolution. No doubt you know that. It's an effort that was supercharged by the COVID-19 pandemic, which sent droves of young strivers and financiers to South Florida for its sunny landscape and relatively lax virus restrictions. Now, Miami faces a test of whether it'll attract a critical mass of money and hype to make it the hub for a new age of the internet. And Elon Musk is speaking out about another aspect of Twitter. The world's richest man recently bought a 9.2% stake in the social media platform and asked his followers whether the service should have an edit button. He, sound, he now says the single most annoying problem on Twitter is crypto spam bots. Musk was, of course, appointed to Twitter's board of directors earlier today. So crypto scam spam bots. I Matt. think scam bots is also a good way to call them. <laughs> I think it could go either way, but this is definitely a very real thing I can say firsthand. Yeah. Ever since we started this show, I've gotten more uh, Twitter interaction than ever. And it's all related. I mean, half of it is people who want us to talk about Ripple only. <laughs> Right? And it's just a lot. Yeah, it's a very engaged audience. I will say it goes to show you just how uh, re prevalent and relevant digital assets has become, but we'll still be checking it out. One story on we Twitter. didn't mention, Lamborghini just came out with a press release saying they're gonna release their final version of the Aventador. It's one of my favorite cars of all time, either next year or the year after. And it's going to be accompanied by a one of one limited edition NFT. <laughs> Um, so I think that's pretty cool. I can't wait to see what the NFT looks like. It's Matt Miller's dream come true. Tie cars together with, with digital an assets. With NFT, I like it. I like <laughs> it a lot. All right, coming up next week, co-founder and CEO of FTX will join us, Sam Bankman-Fried. Very excited to catch up with SBF um, for a conversation. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.